Hello, hello! Welcome to another episode of History in the Dark. I am your host, Darkness the Curse. And before we begin, as always, thank you so much to my generous patrons, my British Rail critics, and of course, my underwater train finders. You are the reason why this content remains so uncomfortable. Now seriously, you have no idea. And today, we are going to discuss one of the most hilariously misunderstood uh, TV broadcasts in history. Not misunderstood on the basis of how awkward and uncomfortable it is, because it is probably the most uncomfortable thing I have ever had to watch in my life. Um, for reasons we're about to get to. But also, there's a lot of misinformation about this. So many articles say things about it, regarding what happens in it, and regarding the people involved, it's just blatantly, provably, verifiably wrong? And I hate that. I don't like that. So we're gonna cover it. And oh my. This is a story about how a TV program surprised a Hiroshima survivor with the co-pilot of the Enola Gay. of the atomic bombs is one of the most pivotal moments in the history of humanity as a whole, not even just warfare. Those bombs changed the world when they were dropped, with Little Boy, an enriched uranium gun-type fission weapon, being dropped on Hiroshima on the 6th of August 1945, and Fat Man, a plutonium implosion-type weapon, being dropped on Nagasaki on the 9th of August, just three days later. Now, regarding the bombs themselves and their use, many people... Well, it, this is a controversial issue. The bombings roughly killed about 200,000 people. And in retrospect, the legacy of those devices is not something that could be handled with careless hands. They changed the world. Atomic bombs, which eventually evolved into nuclear missiles, were really the only thing that could effectively be described as a super weapon. It was the closest humanity had ever come, and probably still has, to wielding the power of a god. And the real question was, how uh, responsible are we with this? But in retrospect, especially now, given the fact that we're still here, I'd say overall humanity has been pretty responsible when it comes to these weapons. Yeah, we've made some mistakes involving nuclear power, above ground nuclear tests were probably a bad call, but in terms of actually using them in warfare again, no one's been willing to push that button since the end of World War II, and those bombs were only used to end the war. At the time, the Allies were kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place. Without dropping the A-bombs, the other option was a straight-up invasion of Japan. This sort of invasion would have resulted in a similar situation that they had already had to deal with when it came to Germany, with civilians, even children, being armed to defend their homeland, because the government involved wouldn't give it up. The defeat of Germany and its following occupation was a friggin' nightmare. The Allies had to divide the country amongst themselves, and though the United States, the UK, and France were willing to eventually give the Germans back their territory and allow them to recover, knowing that the people themselves weren't necessarily to blame for the actions of their government, Stalin and his Soviet Union weren't uh, so willing to do the giving back territory part. Stalin was very much about occupying the countries he had seized during the war, and it was for that reason the Soviet Union was now so large. An actual invasion of Japan would have taken a very long time, and resulted in many, many deaths on both sides. The bombs were seen as a way to end the war without any of that happening. If they could convince Japan that this conflict was over, please, for the love of everything, surrender then perhaps all that could be avoided. Additionally, the Soviet Union actually declared war with Japan, as they hadn't actually done that yet, the same day Nagasaki was bombed. So it wasn't like they didn't know what Stalin intended. Japan would wind up surrendering on the 15th of August, six days after the last bomb, and a nuclear device hasn't been used in warfare since. Now, whether or not the bombs were justified because of all this, well, you can argue about that in the comments all you want. 
I personally view them as a necessary evil. It wasn't something that anybody wanted to do. Even the people in the Allied Command knew that using these bombs would be an atrocious act, but the benefits of doing so in that unique situation outweighed the cons, at least as far as they were concerned at the time. And it did keep Japan independent. The U.S. did occupy Japan for a time, but they were allowed to retain their independence after a while. Japan has, of course, evolved into a thriving country, and is a close ally of the U.S. to this day. But whether or not you think they were justified or think they were horrible or whatever, no amount of discussion is going to be a comfort to the victims of the bombs. Because much like the Tokyo fire bombings, which killed, actually, more people than the bombs did, many of them were civilians. They were non-combatants. And when the B-29 Enola Gay and her crew flew over Hiroshima on that day and dropped Little Boy, well, none of them had any idea what they would be in for. Many of the victims would have been dead before they even realized what had happened. But one man who did not die was named Kiyoshi Tanamoto. He was a Methodist minister, which was a bit unusual for Japan. But he found his faith as a teenager and took himself very seriously. He was in Hiroshima when the bomb was dropped and miraculously did survive. Afterwards, he did his best to help the survivors, particularly his work with a group known as the Hiroshima Maidens. They were a group of 25 Japanese women who were school-age girls when they were seriously disfigured as a result of the bomb. The thermal flash of that blast caused intense scarring and burns, stuff that was permanent and hard to correct. They would need extensive reconstructive surgery to regain some sense of their identities and normalcy. They themselves, of course, couldn't afford this, but Tanamoto wanted to raise money for the women so they could get reconstructive surgery in the United States in the 1950s. Tanamoto traveled to the U.S. with some of the girls in May of 1955, and that's when he unwittingly appeared on a television program known as This Is Your Life. This is your life, the program for all America. It was a very popular show in America at the time, and is actually one of the earliest television shows in general. TV was, of course, brand new back then, and in the booming economy of the 50s, more people could afford this newfangled TV device. Let's get out of here. This Is Your Life actually started on radio for NBC, and ran in that format from 1958 to 1952. But then it was adapted for television, and ran from 1952 to 1961. A pretty decent life cycle for a show, and it's probably one of the earliest examples of something that could be called reality TV. It isn't like what we would think of when it comes to modern reality TV shows. Somebody want a hundred dollars? Thank you! But it's probably closer to something like those gimmick talk shows, like Maury, or even Dr. Phil, where they're utilizing the stories of real people in order to entertain others, or perhaps exact sympathy. Dr. Phil's thing is generally dealing with troubled people and talking about their various issues when it comes to behavior or addiction or things like that. <laughs> and someone like Maury is, well, a little crazier. You are not! <laughs> this Is Your Life also had a very, very simple concept, and it was a bit more down to earth for audiences back then. The idea was to surprise the guests who the host, Ralph Edwards, already knew the entire backstory of from the get-go. He went through a retrospective of their own lives in front of the audience. The surprise element usually involved introducing them to someone they hadn't seen in a while, someone who had affected their lives in very big ways. And that's where we're going to get to the episode that aired on the 11th of May, 1955. Again, the show is based off of, shall we say, surprise. So Tadamoto, who was invited on the show, wasn't actually told what he was really in for. He thought he was being interviewed about his work with the Hiroshima Maidens. And to an extent, that is true. Edwards does bring that up. But it's pretty clear from the get-go that Tanamoto isn't quite understanding of how American TV works. Ralph Edwards was very ahead of his time. He was a top-tier entertainer and presenter. He had a solid stage presence and a clear-cut radio voice. He talks very loudly compared to Tanamoto, who is well-spoken, but is a lot more quiet and reserved. Instead of a classical interview format, Edwards often answers questions for Tanamoto. 
which comes off as a bit frustrating, but that was pretty normal for the show as a whole. Again, Edwards already knew everything about Tanamoto before he was even invited on the show. The whole point is to present it for the audience. He does sometimes allow Tanamoto to answer, and it's in those moments that I think the episode really shines, as he does ask him about the Hiroshima bombing, and Tanamoto's recollection is clear and somewhat haunting. What did you do when you heard that bomb? Well, I didn't hear any sound, I but I saw a strange flash running through me the air. And took a couple of steps into the garden and lay on the ground. And I felt strong blast of wind. Now, as you're probably already aware by the title of this video and how I let on, the big surprise guest for Tanamoto is one Robert Alvin Lewis. He was the co-pilot and aircraft commander of the Enola Gay the B-29 that dropped Little Boy on Hiroshima. His presence is alluded to very early in the episode, although he is not revealed for the audience. It's the only warning that Tanamoto is given that something a little, um, unexpected is going to happen. But he is not the only surprise for Tanamoto. As Edwards backtracks and goes through Tanamoto's early life, he talks about how he became a Methodist minister in the first place. The surprise guest they bring on is a woman by the name of Bertha Starkey, who Tanamoto seems to greet with tears of joy. Edwards goes on to interview Miss Starkey, and she explains that she was doing missionary work in Korea when she met Tanamoto. Tanamoto had been completely cut off from his family by his father. His mother had passed away, and his father refused to accept his son's acceptance of the Methodist beliefs. His father had been a staunch Buddhist, apparently. Miss Starkey became a bit of a mother figure to Tanemoto, and it's clear by their interaction that he is absolutely overjoyed to see her again after so much time. It's genuinely wholesome, and a very sweet moment on the episode. But don't worry, we're gonna get to the uncomfortable part. But first, more wholesome things. Edward goes on to explain that a few years later, once Tanamoto received a scholarship to study theology in America, his sister actually arranged for a bit of a reconciliation between him and his father, which apparently went pretty well. Then they bring on Dr. Marvin Green, a really good friend of Tanamoto's who he studied with at the university. They hadn't seen each other in several years, and again, it's pretty clear they're happy to see each other in general. Another wholesome moment for the episode. Things are going quite well. That's ruin everything. The one thing I'll give Edwards at this point is that apparently the sponsor for the episode, which keeps coming up a lot, involving nail polish, did not wish to interrupt this part of the show, as they felt it would be in poor taste to advertise over a story of an atomic bomb survivor. And you know what? Good call. Our wonderful sponsor, Hazel Bishop, has asked that we omit our commercial at this time, so we'll not interrupt our story, and we're very grateful to our, our wonderful sponsor for this thoughtful gesture. Naturally, things get a lot darker in the episode from here. Tanamoto begins to recount more of the day that the bomb was dropped, as well as his tale of survival. Uh, running away from the city in the uh, in silence, uh, their skin peeling off, and the hanging from face from arm, but strange to say, in silence, it looked uh, like a procession of ghosts. But on top of that, the mystery man in the back starts describing his position when the bomb was dropped, as he was apparently there too. As you know, it's Captain Robert Lewis, who was invited on the show, and by invited, I mean he wasn't actually told what he was doing till the last possible moment. This is where things get really sketchy for the show in general. The producers had already attempted to get several of the other crew members of the Enola Gay on the show and were declined. When they asked Lewis, they didn't really tell him exactly what he was doing or who he was meeting. He thought he was just there to describe what he did that day, which that is all he winds up doing, but he wasn't told he was going to be meeting a survivor of Hiroshima on national television. Lewis attempted to back out. He actually left the studio, walked to a nearby restaurant in order to meal and drink. The producers followed him and managed to convince him to come back. Lewis finished his drink, but did not eat his meal. He did agree to return, but as you'll soon find out, it's pretty clear he just so does not want to be there. Edwards introduces Lewis just as he introduces the other guests, but the reactions from both parties are absolutely not the same as the previous two surprise guests. They do shake hands, 
but it's one of the most awkward handshakes in the history of humanity. Tanemoto's body language is almost fearful, concerned, worried. He doesn't even know how to react or what he's even supposed to say to this guy. And, you know, yeah, how would he? Lewis, on the other hand, is equally uncomfortable. He stands politely with his hands behind his back, but he is profusely sweating and delivers his recounting of the day the bomb was dropped in a solid but clearly stunted and awkward way. Kokura. About an hour before we hit the coastline of Japan, we were notified that Hiroshima was clear. Therefore, Hiroshima became our target. Putting these two in front of a TV camera could be described as somewhat questionable, at best. It's one of the earliest moments in television history where producers have taken advantage of people's emotions to drive up viewership. It's a thing that TV still does today! So give further props to Mr. Ralph Edwards, who was clearly ahead of the time when it comes to making horrible decisions in the name of high ratings. But the one thing I do want to note here is that as Lewis recounts his story, awkwardly, nervously, clearly showing visible remorse, Tanamoto's expression seems to change. He relaxes a bit, and almost seems to express a bit of empathy for Lewis's position. When Lewis finishes his story, he wants to leave the stage as quickly as possible. He shakes hands with Tanamoto one more time. Tanamoto actually claps his hand with both of his hands, and seems to linger on it a bit longer, as if he wishes to say something further. Their interaction lasts only a couple of minutes, but as I have repeatedly pointed out, it is one of the most uncomfortable two minutes in the history of everything. You entered something in your log at that time. As I said before, Mr. Edwards, I wrote down later. My God, what have we done? Edwards tries to recover Tanamoto's mood by hitting him with one more last-minute surprise guest which turns out to be his wife, who he just left behind in Japan. She's brought their children with her as well, and Tanamoto seems very happy to see her, of course. The rest of the episode is actually discussing what Tanamoto thought he was there for, which was the Hiroshima Maidens. All the guests are asked to come back out after a few more minutes, and another blasted nail polish ad, thanks for that, and that included Lewis. His demeanor seems to be a bit more calm at this point, though he is not asked to speak again. And this is the point when Edwards actually turns to the audience and tells them how they can donate to help pay for the surgeries for the Hiroshima Maidens. He also prevents Tanamoto and his family several gifts from the studio, including a Ben and Hal movie camera, which would have been a pretty nice gift in the 50s. Lewis steps forward and presents the first contribution on behalf of the crew of the Enola Gay, as well as his company and his family. Additionally, Edwards gives Tanamoto two more checks from the show's sponsors, each totaling $500. That's about five and a half thousand dollars in today's money. So Tanamoto would have left the studio with over $11,000 to help pay for the surgery of the Hiroshima Maidens. So the awkwardness did kind of pay off in the end. Plus, I'm sure there were plenty of other donations sent from among the viewers of that episode as well. Allegedly, the check that Lewis gives was actually just a slip of paper that he was instructed by the producers to give in order to make him not look bad in the public eye. I can't confirm whether that's true or not, but that's what some sources say. Additionally, Tanamoto's eldest daughter had a bit of an interesting take on the events of that recording. According to her, when she first saw Lewis, they actually wanted to hate him. He was supposed to be their enemy, but after seeing his remorse, she began to actually empathize with him. That was one of the events that turned her into a world-class peace activist. She's done tremendous work in that field, and continues to do so to this day. As for what happened after the episode directly, well, some sources say that Lewis was drunk, but that isn't true at all. He only had that one drink, though some sources say right after the episode he went straight to the bar. And again, I can't confirm that. But even if he did, I really don't blame him. I would have done the same thing! Because, wow! Lewis apparently got into some trouble later with his superiors in the military, as they felt he might have, you know, kind of made the mission look like it had been a heinous act and not something that was necessary to end World War II. Now, on one hand, yeah, but on the other hand, look, guys, it is totally possible, hear me out on this, it's possible to say that the atomic bombs were a bad, horrible thing that occurred 
but still concede that given the alternative that the world was presented with at that time, it was also the best option. I would love to sit here and tell you that I really genuinely believed that not dropping the bombs was a better idea, because Lord knows the last thing I ever want to have to say is, yes, nuke them, that's a great idea. Because, no, of course I don't want to say that. But, in that unique circumstance, when the only alternate course of action was doing something that would result in far more death and destruction, it really was the right call. That doesn't mean Lewis shouldn't be remorseful, of course. As many soldiers often are after a conflict, post-traumatic stress disorder has only in recent years been more understood. Lewis and the rest of the crew of the Enola Gay, as well as the crew of Boxcar, the one that dropped Fat Man on Nagasaki, had a tremendous burden to bear. All the maintained that dropping the bombs was necessary, that doesn't mean they necessarily wanted to do it. That doesn't mean they had to like the fact that it had to happen. Lewis is also often misquoted. He does say on the show that one of the things he wrote down in his log during the flight was, My God, what have we done? But this is only half of the quote. The rest of the quote says, Have we ended the war in one bombing? Pointing out the sheer power that the bombs had, and the fact that it was only one plane that dropped a bomb. Prior to that point, bombing runs took place with multiple bombers, dropping thousands of tons of ordnance. The Tokyo fire bombings were just like that. But with atomic bombs, you only needed one. And the thought of that is rather alarming. Lewis would eventually retire from his military career and actually became a self-taught stone sculptor. One of the sculptures was actually thematically related to the bombing of Hiroshima. He also wound up selling his manuscript log from the mission in 1971 to support his family. Tanamoto, for his part, according to his daughter, actually didn't regret his time spent on the show. Awkward as it was, it had paid off, for one thing. He made a ton of money for the girls he was trying to help, and he seemed to have some level of sympathy for Lewis's position. Apparently, the two actually stayed in contact and wrote letters to each other over the years. It's not known exactly what they had said to each other, but since their interactions lasted for so long, it seems to imply they may have developed a bit of a distant friendship, which is somewhat wholesome, all things considered. Tanamoto's activities were often in the public eye in order to garner support, but he actually gained a bit of a reputation as a publicity seeker, and that attracted the attention of the US and Japanese authorities, who viewed him as an anti-nuke troublemaker. Ah, Cold War era politics, you will never cease to amaze me. He would pass away on September 28th, 1986, at the age of 77, and Lewis would die June 18th, 1983, at the age of 65. And as for Ralph Edwards, the chipper host of this awkward, awkward situation? Well, he would go on to have a long and successful career, and live a far longer than both of his guests that day, passing away November 16th, 2005, at the age of 92. As for the episode itself, well, like I said, there's a ton, a ton, a stupid amount of misinformation about it. One source I read even claimed that Lewis went on to commit suicide after the episode, which is absolutely absurd. That did not happen, and many paint him as a drunk, awkwardly stammering through his appearance. He wasn't drunk that day. He may have gotten drunk after, but he wasn't drunk on the show. He was visibly nervous and upset that he was being put through this, because the producers had lied to him. They hadn't told him what was going on until the last minute. Tanamoto didn't know either. That was the whole show's theme. Surprise. But often, This Is Your Life's surprises were a bit more wholesome, like the first two guests had been. This was... No. No, 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 no. Just because it worked out for the girls, and Tanamoto gained a lot of money from it, doesn't make what the producers of the show did any less kind of, frankly, despicable. They took advantage of one of the most horrific elements of war by surprising a victim of an atomic bomb with one of the men who had dropped the thing. That's... Not okay for either side here. Lewis did what he did because he had to. Those were his orders, and at the time it was the right call. That doesn't mean he doesn't have guilt over it. Tanamoto had suffered the effects of the bomb. Was the bomb necessary? Yes, but the effects were strong and horrible, and people suffered, including him. That's why he was even in the U.S. at the time. And the producers of This Is Your Life is like, hey, how about we put these two together? What zaniness will occur, viewers? It's just gross. It's gross. It's really, really, really gross. 
entertaining TV? I mean, yeah, look at modern reality TV. TV shows still do this kind of nonsense all the time, but this is one of the earliest examples of it that I've ever seen. Regardless of what any of you may think about the bombs, whether you think they were justified, whether you think they weren't, whether you're somewhere in the middle, let's just all agree on this at the end of the day. This idea was terrible, this is why I don't watch TV even now, and I don't think we want to be put in a position where anyone feels the need to use nuclear weapons ever again. We shouldn't be at the point where that's the best case scenario. And with that, a special thank you to all my underwater train finders. Thomas Ward, Sumdu267, Orange Glass, Royal Hudson2860, Lord Hoth444, Benjamin Owens, Panzer Kitsune131-232, Mr. Black Rose, Master of None, Josh Johnson, Metal for Life Guy, Matthew Gavin, Arthur Roy, DM Tribal Typhoon, Tommy Rossini, Lord Captain Von Thrust III, Joshua Long, Alaric Jaspers, Brian, Jack Carson's Rero videos, Major Klutz, Hayden DeGro, Ohio Trucker One, and Ty Hammonds Jr. Till next time, this is Darkness, and a bit of a fond farewell.